So they say a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, but because of the events over the past year or so have left us so speechless, it won't surprise you that some of the photos we're going to talk about today uh, will do the same. Um, and so, you know, from documenting the second full year of the pandemic and its impact on so many lives to ongoing protests, press photographers visually brought audiences into the center of 2021. Welcome to the GBH studio here at the Boston Public Library and hello to those who are watching online. We have a visually interactive conversation planned for you today. I'm Lee Hill and you know now in its second year the Boston Press Photographers Association is showcasing the award-winning photos from their annual Pictures of the Year contest. This outdoor exhibit can now be seen in Copley Square until May 25th and then in Jamaica Plain at Jamaica Pond until June 10th. Now joining me today are two members of the board of the Boston Press Photographers Association uh, and they were instrumental in making this exhibit happen and were on the front lines of documenting this year with their cameras. So please join me in welcoming Jessica Rinaldi, a Boston Globe photographer, and Meredith Nierman, my colleague, GBH News Director of Photography. Welcome. Thank you, thank you for having us. And Meredith is also kind of running our slideshow today, so she's doing double duty. Um, welcome to our BPL studio, both of you. We're glad to have you, and um, this is gonna be an exciting time. Um, so, you know, we're going to look at some of the award-winning photos from this exhibit, but first I want to ask the both of you a question, uh, a broader question, by quoting the late photojournalist Gordon Parks, who I know is dear to all of us, um, whose brilliant work was famously captured in Life magazine for decades. Uh, in his words, quote, I picked up a camera because it was my choice of weapons against what I hated most about the universe, racism intolerance, poverty. He spoke of it as a calling. So I wanna ask the both of you before we get started, Meredith and Jess, give us a sense of, you know, what compelled you to this profession and what compelled you to pick up your camera? Do you want me to start? Sure. Um, I, I think I saw a camera as a way to tell stories, right? I, I'm not a good writer, but, but I, can see, um, I can see images and, and figure out a way that those that can be compelling and tell somebody's story. And I think a camera has always been um, a convenient excuse to open doors and get into people's lives and really be able to show what they're going through in the world. Yeah, I, um, I actually fell into photojournalism on a trip many years ago. I, I was in Japan and uh, borrowed a little digital camera and started taking photos and when I came back and shared them with people, I had this experience of realizing how a camera would allow me to um, bring back the things I had the privilege of experiencing and seeing. Um, I come from a family of, of artists, but I thought for many years growing up, I wasn't an artist because I couldn't, I couldn't draw, I couldn't sculpt or anything like that. And when I picked up a camera, I realized though I had the ability to see. And so the camera became the thing that my hands couldn't do, um, you know, through painting or sculpting. So to me, that, that is just, uh, it's an incredible privilege to have that come into my life and be able to come together like that. And so eventually, so to speak, you both found your own lens. Yes, yeah. indeed. Literally yeah. and figuratively. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which you're always finding over time. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah for sure. Um, so now onto our presentation. Uh, you know, press photographers take tens of thousands of photos every year, but this exhibit features only a sliver of them. Um, you know, why are these photos considered the best? Um, well, just to, to, give a, to ground this in a little background about the contest. So um, all of our members are press photographers in this area, freelance, working for outlets. Um, we have this contest every year to showcase the work. The judging happens from the outside. So the people who come in to do the judging are not from this community. They don't know our work. So in that way, um, it's not biased. We're not um, out promoting ourselves. Um, but I think they bring a strong criteria to the work. They're, it just speaks so eloquently of this, but I'll start. I mean, I think when judging contests, just as people taking in photography, you're looking for things that move you, that move people in a certain way. I'm gonna let Jess pick it up, because she's 
She says it's better than anybody. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I do, but um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that I think that what people are looking for, or what always rises in a photograph, is a moment that really grabs you, um, something that pulls you in and kind of leads your eye through the frame and makes you want to know more. Those pictures that you keep going back to time and time again, um, so that you can really kind of see more every time. And so sometimes that's done, you know, by capturing an amazing moment. Sometimes that's done by using composition or light, um, anything that kind of really evokes emotion. Yeah, and, I, and so well, I was just going to ask how many people submitted this year? How many submissions did you get? Oh, do you have that number? Probably offhand? a lot. <laughs> Let's just say a lot. It, it, <laughs> it's quite a few, and I apologize that we don't have that number okay. offhand, but um, they spend how many days judging? It's three days three of days judging. Three days full time yeah. judging, yeah. And it's a, I think it's, it's probably somewhere around 80 to 100 submissions, I would guess, yeah. okay. somewhere in there. And this is the second year. Uh, of the exhibit, of not the, exhibit. Of the, the contest right. has been going on for quite some time. Okay, yeah. great. Well, um, let's look at some of the photos from this past year. You know, just this photo was taken by AP photographer David Goldman. Can you explain what's going on here? It looks like they're looking out a window. Yeah. Um, what's happening? Yeah, this is a portrait um, that I really love of David's, where it's still in the moment in the pandemic where um, He's on the outside looking in, right? There was this moment still in 2021, which I think it's easy to forget, that we're, none of us were vaccinated yet. So this couple is um, in the midst of that kind of desperation to try to find the vaccine at this point. And they're navigating that really complicated system uh, online in Rhode Island. And so what I love about this is that he's on the outside looking in. And, um, and you know, part of that is, it speaks to that isolation that we were all feeling back in 2021. And um, yeah, I just think it's such a beautiful frame. It's layered with these, this reflection of the trees, like they're lost in the forest. And, and you know, there's also this element of separation between the photographer and the subjects, because at that point in the pandemic, we were still very concerned about spreading the virus, contracting it. Um, all this was a concern. And I think it's really easy to forget that that was just this past April. May. Yeah, and they both appear to be, at least from this vantage point, a little up in age. And we know that the pandemic disproportionately affected a lot of seniors, exactly. at least during that first round. So, um, yeah, really compelling there. Um, you know, is there more about this that really moves you? Um, you know, as a photographer, what do you think this person uh, Mr. Goldman did to, had to do to get that shot. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's so much thought that goes into this, right? There's so much thought and good seeing, and this is, this is what a successful image does. It's, it's somebody taking a frame and layering it with all sorts of different information. So the reflection builds upon the two characters, the silhouette works off of the woman who's in the light. It's all kind of there um, for the taking, and you go back and revisit this picture, and you can just see more and more in it. And so. Yeah totally the type of photo that I love. So Meredith, these next three photos are so full of tension. Um, no doubt they channel some of the anxiety that's very much still in the world right now with so much happening. Um, tell us exactly what we're seeing here and what makes these images so powerful. Sure. What are we looking at? Yeah, I'm going to flip through them one by one and, and sort of explain them and come back and talk about them in a bigger way. But I'm just realizing now the, the shift from the photo, David Goldman's photo that just just showed of sort of isolation and, and the quiet difficulty of that to then turning into something like this really exemplifies the year in some ways. It's, this is a photo of the insurrection in Washington, D.C. It was taken by Joseph Prezioso. Um, and, you know, I look at this and I'm reminded how this is really what kicked off our year. Um, we had the pandemic going on and um, in many cases people were much more isolated and then we had this, you know, never before um, event happen in Washington. I'm going to keep going and show you a couple more. So this is actually a local photo at City Hall. This is by Nancy Lane from the Boston Herald. Um, and what's happening here is a security guard at, at City Hall is trying to keep a protester from entering into the building. There were protesters there that day because Mayor Wu had announced um, that there was a mask mandate for city workers. Um, and 
sorry. Vaccine yeah. mandates. I'm sorry, a vaccine mandate for city workers. Thank you, Jess. Um, and you know, you see here this sort of inside out looking um, experience of this confrontation. And then the final one is actually from the border, um, the US-Mexican border. This was taken by Allison um, Dinner, who's also a freelancer. Um, and you know, I think probably many people have seen other frames from this moment, but what's happening is here, these are Haitian um, migrants who are trying to cross into the United States. Um, and I'm gonna flip back because I want everybody to see these images again. What strikes me in all of them and what makes them such like potent frames is just not only how much tension is in them, but there's also movement, like in a sense of claustrophobia in some of these. So the way Joseph shot this frame here, like he really was right on the ground. He is not zooming in from far away with the long lens, he is right there. Um, and I think that adds so much to the frame. Um, and you can feel the chaos of the scene in the image. That is something very intentional on his part. Like you can go to something like this and not capture that. And I think he did a great job here. Um, again, I look at this image and I, f it, I feel tension, I feel conflict rising, you don't know how things are gonna turn out, and I think the way it's framed too, you almost feel stuck in the doorway um, with the security guard. Um, and then, you know, in this frame, it may not be so claustrophobic, but there's so much happening like, in this frame. There's so much action and movement. You can feel um, a, a chaos in this as well, I think also, the sense of movement for me brings me to a, to a feeling of like how desperate these folks must have been to kind of to make this to make this move and to face this risk here, which they clearly um, faced in a very profound way. And I think all of those things come together across these images. To they're not only important documents of history, but I think they they document it so well emotionally right. as well. Especially that first photo really captures a democracy under siege. And you yeah. can see, you know, from the tear gas and, uh, you know, the, the, the flags that are being flown and uh, a little bit of an image of the Capitol in the background. Some of that tension is still very much alive, yeah. uh, very much alive yes. now. Um, so, you know, to both of you, we all lived through 2021 and I'm sure uh, many of us want to forget the past two years, the pandemic uh, layered on top of you know, um, uprisings against racial justice happening across this country, uh, you know, against uh, so many other things going on. Um, so many of us want to forget that. So what do you think the rationale is behind showcasing these photos, often depicting painful and, you know, traumatic moments that many people are trying to escape? Um, you know, what would you say to the person who would say, I'm trying to get away from that, you know? I need escapism away from that. Why do you feel it's important to confront people with these images? I, I think as, um, it, it's often said, right, that journalists write the first draft of history. And as photojournalists, we're out there documenting history as it unfolds. And, um, and we take that job very seriously. And we think it's really important to, to make a collective document of these times that we're living through, which are so tumultuous and, and unexpected in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's kind of like looking back to that David Goldman image, I had already forgotten that it had only been not very long ago that we got our first dose of the vaccine, right? right. Um, and I think that these past couple of years have been such a blur that there's something for me at least about laying out these images that um, it, it sort of allows me to revisit this, this moment in time that we've just lived through in this way that's like, oh right, this actually only happened not too long ago and I've already kind of pushed past it. And I think one of the important things about everything that's going on right now is I think it's really important for people to examine it, to consider these, this moment that we're living in as historic and to try to learn from it and not repeat these same mistakes that we seem to be making over and over again. Yeah. yeah. So photography, in essence, is also obviously a tool for remembering. Yes. Right. Yeah. Remembering. Yeah. And what I would add is, I mean, we, you know, it is so easy to forget, as Jess said, and it's really easy to forget when the things we ha we are holding are so difficult and sometimes confusing, and sometimes we feel helpless around what we can do. And but but that record is so important, and you know, people can also come back to these. They may not be able to take some of these images right now. Others may. 
Um, but the fact that they are there um, as a record and for people to come back to or for us to resurface when relevant again is, is a really important part of our jobs. This next image we are going to see is another uh, photo from the Associated Press, uh, Stephen Sine. Sine, yeah. Sine. Um, <laughs> what's the story here? What are we looking at? So this was from a, um, a dedication ceremony down in Boston Harbor for the, um, the Middle Passage port marker, yeah. uh, which basically was put up to acknowledge Boston's role in buying and selling enslaved people, um, which I think is a history that a lot of people would rather not acknowledge. So there's a, there's a moment, I think, that's really important of just documenting it. But I think Stephen was very intentional about the way that he framed this, right, with this big chain running through the center of the frame. It's, it's evocative of that history in our country and, and also of how that history still impacts us today. Um, so for me, this is a very, very powerful frame. Yeah, and it's so interesting that they're wearing white and that you have children here yes. who are, are marking um, this event. How can you tell, what can you tell us about sort of, you know, capturing younger people in their raw emotion as it relates to events like this. Um, I think, I you think. You can see in, the innocence there. Yeah, you can see the innocence there. I, I think that there's a moment for all of us in these, when we're documenting things like this, where there are children present or, or people who are younger, where you want to be really sensitive, right, to, to their experience. And, um, and so I think it's always really important to, to try to make the best photo that you can, but then to also engage those people afterwards and make sure that they're okay with their photo being yeah. in the paper, right? Because um, it, can be, it can be jarring <laughs> to have your image be public. And so I think, you know, we're always trying to, um, to tell the story, but also to do so in a way that is respectful of the people in the images. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, um, I agree with that 100%. I would also say that I have experienced that when I, when I engage with young people before taking their photo or after, m way more than grown-ups, they're like, sure, no, no, no big deal. And that doesn't, we have to start at Jess's point, and that is the right place. But I have s very much been struck by how uh, younger people, um, that sense of being photographed is quite different than when I was growing up where you know, it wasn't constant, constant picture taking in my life and I think it's because younger people are living with cameras all the time, they're documenting their lives, their friends' lives and I think it creates a different openness sometimes. Well, we're gonna move a little closer sure. to home with images. Yeah. Meredith, these next three photos are very local, um, less than a mile from where we are right now taken at City Hall Tell us more about these and what strikes um, what strikes you. Sure. Um, well, this first one here is of Kim Janey, who um, uh, was mayor of Boston Beautiful briefly. Shot. Yeah, it's um, by Angela Rowlings, who's a freelance photographer here in Boston. Um, and this is her uh, inauguration. This is a moment in her inauguration. Um, what is so important about this image um, is that this past year, we have had a historical moment at City Hall, which is Boston, which has forever been um, primarily, uh, our mayors have been white men. They ha Not primarily, they have been white men. Um, we haven't had a woman mayor, let alone a person of color. And um, this year we had Kim Janey and also another photograph that I'm going to show you soon, Michelle Wu. And I, I want to say what I love about this photograph, besides that it is a great historical document, is that this and the one we're going to see of Janie are classic scenes that we see of mayors, of elected officials, you know, at podiums, waving after their inauguration. And, and I, I love that she actually stuck with that classic thing that we've seen, um, because it kind of validates the importance of, of this change that's happened in this city, and a long overdue change I think many people would feel. This is a, another frame from Janie's inauguration, and again, I, I, what I love about this is the combination of classic photo. We see this photo for inaugurations. There's, there's usually a white hand on a Bible and a, a child or a partner um, standing nearby, and here we have the, the hand of a black woman, and this is her granddaughter actually looking up. And I, the, for me, the child, like of course, as always, symbolizes the future, and you know, and having role models and the importance of that. 
And then this final one is of Ma our current Mayor Wu. Um, this is a press conference that she gave after being sworn in, sworn in as mayor. Um, and here again, you see this is this is a photo we've all seen, or you know, where an elected official surrounded by the press. Um, and I think that really shows her uh, in the power that she she has. Um, in both portraits, I think what I love is that the photographers centered their smiles. Their smiles come through. There's there's such positivity and, and joy, and I really appreciate that these these images show both women, you know, in that in that place in these really historic moments. Can I ask both of you? Is there a different approach that you take to your job or how you show up when you know that you are documenting history? When you know that you are taking a picture of something that hasn't ever happened before? and you know will probably be immortalized in a special way. Like when we see Kim Janey and, and Mayor Wu, is there, um, you know, is there a special, uh, you know, uh, way that you think about doing your job in those moments? I triple check my equipment <laughs> <laughs> okay. and bring extra cards. Um, no, and, and get there as early as I can because these, these things tend to be very crowded. Um, so I am thinking about the enormity of it. I mean, I would say that I, I try to treat every, every person in every situation as if they're the mayor of Boston and, and it's an important moment. But you do want, you want to have the best access as possible in a moment like this. You don't want to be crowded out. Um, because then you, you, you won't be able to take images that, that allow people to truly see what is happening. And I, I, think, you all, I think in everything that we do, right, we're, we're always trying to keep, for me at least, I'm always trying to keep in mind what is, the, what is the kernel of the story and how do I illustrate that, right? I think Angela did a really beautiful job uh, in the subtlety that's in those photos, right? Like this photo, it's, it's subtle. It's a subtle moment. And I'm always looking for those kind of quiet uh, pictures that that will just kind of evoke something further in somebody. So uh, especially on a historic occasion, I think it's such a privilege that we get to witness history. It's one of the most incredible parts of this job. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you want to always do it justice. Can you ever think of a time where the emotion of the photographer has come through in what we're all seeing in an image or what you've done with anything you've done? Um, I have always felt like my subjective experience in a moment is a key part of making a good photo. Um, and I think that sometimes my emotions, my reactions to things lead me to see things that, you know, if I were coming in and trying to be purely objective, which I believe is impossible, um, I might miss that because I'm not being like highly attuned and sensitive in the moment. I would also say that um, it's keeping my, trying to be mindful of my sub subjectivity and thinking about how it might influence how I frame moments or frame people um, is really key. So I, I work with all those feelings um, and, and try to use them for good. I think that's right, yeah. So, I mean, we know as with, you know, journalists of the written word as well as, you know, journalists who are, who are capturing moments for us visually, um, sometimes we put ourselves in harm's way. Um, can you talk about some of the complexity involved in getting the best shot, you know, um, in sort of telling not just, uh, you know, capturing what people see, but the story behind the photo? Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the difficulties you face when photograph yeah. when photographing? Well, I think, I, I think that the Joseph Prezioso photo is a great example, right? It, the January 6th insurrection photo. That, that's a moment where nobody knew that that was going to happen. I mean, he was prepared, I'm sure, with a, a gas mask because we have started to take precautions like that. Um, but I think that there are, there are just moments that you don't expect, and a photographer's job is to kind of run towards those moments. So in a lot of ways, um, that's just your, your basic instinct, but you have to kind of listen to whatever is like little voices in the back of your head that says stop when it does. Um, so there are moments in which, yeah, you kind of you charge ahead, but you do so very cautiously in the, I can't really quite describe yeah. that balance because it's irrational. <laughs> I mean, we, we talk about this in our own newsroom, which, you know, no, 
no picture, I mean, I'm the photographer, like, is, is worth getting yourself seriously hurt or, or somebody else seriously hurt. But, so you just have to be very, very mindful, I think, and, and use your instincts. And, you know, there are certain photographers who will go into situations that others won't, and that's, that's also okay. We're gonna change gears now to sports. Uh, I'm newer to Boston as Meredith as you know, and so you know I'm really starting to see how crazy this town can be when it comes to rooting for a favorite team. Um, just talk about these next three images because it's related to, to sports. Yeah, so I mean, I think what's great about Boston is not only do we have world-class teams, but we have world-class photographers who are out there taking these photos. And I think it's evidenced by these winners, right? They're all taken from the Olympics. And for a sports photographer to go to the Olympics, um, it's almost as big a deal as competing at the Olympics, right? Because as a photographer, you're in competition with everybody else who's there. Um, and I think if you walk down to the exhibit and you really look at these uh, images, what you'll see is not only that these photographers are just kind of nailing the peak action, right, that you think of when you think of sporting events uh, or the reaction, but they're also telling more complicated stories. Um, in each of these photos, the subjects are alone, right, or, they're, or it's far away and you see the empty stands. These are photographers who are, again, just, they're telling stories, it's not just sports. It's like the intersection of COVID and the Olympics and what does that experience look like? It's, it's something that we wouldn't even have considered. Um, so I think, that, I think that there's so much nuance that happens in, in sports pictures that most people don't uh, automatically think of when they think of a sports photographer. Yeah, I mean, the best feedback I, I ever got after um, photographing a sporting event was somebody said to me, wherever you're standing, turn, your, turn around and turn your camera around on the crowd and look around. And, you know, it, it seems so obvious once this person gave me that feedback, but um, sometimes it isn't because the, the sport itself is so exciting and you have to get those images. And so I, I think just this image um, that we're looking at now, which is by Brian Snyder from Reuters, I mean, I think, you know, in a way, this is an image of the Olympics as we've been experiencing it, so different than what we normally imagine. But, you know, sports still happening, but in great isolation. Yeah. Um, I want to pause here and say that we are also going to open up um, to questions from the audience. If people here have questions about what you're seeing, uh, we do have uh, someone who will be roving to get your question before we wrap. Okay, so moving on. Yeah. Um, you know, Meredith, photojournalists are often running around covering multiple stories in a day, uh, but this next series of images uh, is really about one person um, over time. Can you tell us about them and just sort of the, the art and the craft of narrative photography focused on one person? Sure, yeah. So um, you're looking at images um, that were part of a much bigger project at GBH called COVID in the Classroom. We followed three high school seniors in this area over the course of their senior year in the middle of the pandemic to, to better understand and to know from them what that experience was like. And I um, spent a great deal of time with this young woman named Anne-Louis Pierre. She was at the time a high school senior at Everett High, class president. Um, and had a big dream to go on to college. Uh, and actually she had a very specific dream school, which was Howard University. Um, no one else in her family had ever gone to college and she entered into her senior year like so many other seniors, which was sitting in her bedroom, you know, on a laptop or sitting at a table, very, very isolated from normal high school experience. Hard for so many kids, and it was for her. But on top of all of that, Anne-Marie had some other really significant challenges. Her father had died from COVID in the first year of COVID. Her mother then, who had previously been sick with cancer, relapsed during this year. Um, and Anne-Marie, who was always very involved with her siblings and cousins, was left to do a lot of the care um, of the kids while also trying to be a high school senior. Um, and so I was able to be with her on and off throughout her entire school year, um, from studying it, learning at home, to being in her home with her family, to eventually being able to venture out and meet some classmates, to going back to school very, very briefly, and then 
to actually um, graduating and getting into that college of her choice, Howard University. My um, alma mater, I'm Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and um, she's now just done with her first year. Um, and so, you know, because of that, getting to spend an ex extended period of time, you, you know, I was able, and, and I think through the photos that I was able to take to kind of share back a much deeper look at her life than, you know, if I had shown up and met her a couple of times somewhere. Can you talk about persuading someone who's really had a difficult time or experienced tragedy to give you that level of access? Yeah. That really takes some vulnerability on their part. Yeah, I mean, well, so we were, you know, this was part of a much larger project, so it was actually an even bigger ask of Anne Lurie and the other kids. Um, you know, they were also shooting their own video diaries that we were posting. Um, but I think you, you ask it and um, if somebody is willing, you sort of have to keep checking in on that ask over time. You don't just assume because there was an initial yes that everything is good to go in free reign. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a regular checking in to see how things feel. There's understanding that not to push on certain things. You know, somebody needs something to just be all to themselves. They need it to be private. Um, and I think there's, there's a sort of learning over time with the person about, uh, you know, you kind of get to know a person pretty well in a certain way and that person gets to know you. And so there is a way you begin to start to talk back and forth and understand back and forth about like what feels okay and what doesn't. But I also regularly check in about that. Have you, can you remember a time when someone initially agreed to let you in and then after a while, they said, actually, this doesn't feel okay. Um, you know, how yeah. did you navigate that? Yeah, I have never had a like, I'm, this doesn't feel okay, I don't wanna do this anymore, though I know people have. Um, what I have had though, is something that initially they thought would be okay for me to be present with them somewhere, they changed their mind. Okay. And sometimes they change their mind well ahead of time and sometimes you show up. And, and the answer of course is absolutely okay. You know, I think that is something we have to, completely respect. Right. I'll give you a, a chance to weigh in on that. Oh, I mean, I agree. I, I think um, when you navigate a long-term story, it's a relationship with someone, right? And you're, you're building trust constantly and you're fostering that trust and connection. And so just like Meredith says, it's not, it's not that somebody gives you access in the beginning and then, and then it's all good, right? It's, it's that you really want to respect um, their lives and their privacy and you want to make sure that you're both on the same page and so I do think it's a constant conversation and I think that there's this misnomer in documentary photography uh, people think that you're just a fly on the wall and that you know you just go in and you disappear but I have always found that not to be the case that it's actually more of much more of a relationship where you're you're present um, you know you you get to know somebody and they get to know you and it's, it's a balancing act because you're not friends per se, right? Um, but you do care. And so I think, I think that people can sense when you're genuine and when you're genuinely invested and um, when your interest is coming from, from a place of care and concern. And I think that that's the most, that's, that type of empathy is what allows this type of work to be done. That's so interesting because I think for most of these photos, when you look at them, it's almost as if the photographer is not even there. Right. But you're saying it's not a pretend like I'm not here, but it actually is a relationship where they know that you're there, but they are somehow able to be their most authentic self in a moment. I think it's a little bit of both, right? Yeah. It's, it's like pretend like I'm not here, but, but in moments I will be here and we'll talk, right? Um, and I think that ultimately they get used to you being there and that's when people reveal a little bit more about their lives in a more authentic way. And that is the value in being able to go back and revisit a subject. Um, yeah, it's that, it's that the story gets purer almost every time you go back because there's, the facade falls away. And what you're seeing is, is I think, truer in ways to their situation. Yeah. You also cover longer form stories in your role at the Boston Globe. Tell us about these next few images that we're about to see. So this was such an incredible thing to be able to witness. Um, 
I don't think there's anything more amazing than being able to be present for the birth of a child, the beginning of somebody's life, right? It's such a magical part of this job. And um, this story is kind of funny because I had actually, this little boy in the, oh, sorry, can you go back one? This little boy in, in the photo who's looking down at the baby, um, Isaac, I was there for his birth uh, back in 2015. And his, I had followed Ashley through her um, pregnancy back then. And I spent months working on the story, and as I like just talked about with the relationship, we really developed a relationship. Um, but in the end, when she gave birth, it was like in the dark, in a, in a bedroom. It was not what she had had in mind. She had had in mind a water birth, and so I had had that in mind for the photos. And so, um, and the story was still relevant. It was still documenting the twists and turns that childbirth can take. But um, I had said to her then, if you ever get pregnant again, will you please let me know? And I didn't expect her to reach out, but she did. <laughs> and, um, and so that's how I ended up coming back to photograph the birth of their third child. And this time it all kind of worked according to plan and everybody was sort of around uh, the tub and the family was there and it just felt so unique in that way. Um, and I think that, you know, again, this kind of goes back to that, the building of the relationship. Like I hadn't talked to her in, in years, except for checking in a little bit every now and again. But, I was kind of able to slide back in and sort of seamlessly, you know, just be there because everybody knew me really well and, and they trusted me and, you know, they knew they were in good hands. Yeah, because I was about to ask, childbirth is such a deeply personal, yeah. um, you know, high risk, uh, you know, vulnerable moment. Do you ever find yourselves in situations where you ask yourself, I don't know if I should be here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think there are those moments, yeah. right, where, where the, the type of um, access that people are granting you to their lives is so profound that you are just kind of saying to yourself, okay, is this, you know, there are moments that I didn't, that maybe I didn't photograph because it felt like a little too much. Uh, you want to always be respectful. I think that's, that's kind of the bottom line. And, and how do you honor the privilege of being there for a moment like that, for someone's graduation after they've been through hell, uh, for someone's childbirth. I mean, how do you, you know, it's a privilege to be able to witness that. Uh, and most people, I'm sure they didn't even let some family members come to that childbirth, right. but you were there. Yeah, I mean, it is such a privilege. Yeah. And, um, and I think that the biggest gift that anyone can give you as a photographer is their time, right? And so um, the all you can do is try to honor it with the best photos that you can take and the most accurate story that you can tell. And the most, I don't know, I mean, it, you're always being compassionate and empathetic and you're trying, to, you're trying to say to yourself, how, if I were to allow someone into my life, how would I want those photos to look, right? Like, I would never ever embarrass anyone or do it. You know what I mean? I'm, I just, I think you really have to respect the dignity of the subject and the situation at all times. Yeah. You know, I would, what I would add is, um, and I'll go back to my story with Anne Lurie, I, I would bet that, you know, after we started spending time together, she could feel the investment that I had um, in, in the work that we were doing together. And, you know, when she got into the school of her choice, I, I don't know, I think it was over text, but I think I screamed in some way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think she felt my happiness for her upon her graduation. And I think that it, that not holding that back because you're a journalist is really important. You know, it is, it, is a, it is a way of, one of the many ways I hope we convey back to the people who are letting us into their lives that it's meaningful for us too, because it was a deeply meaningful experience for me. We have some questions from the audience. One, do either of you have advice for freelance photographers? How do you get started and how do you make, um, you know, how do you make content that will someday become noticed and how do you get better at it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think a great place to start is, you know, by documenting your, your own life and, and what's around you in some way. So there are stories around all of us all the time, um, whether it's the people we're living with or, you know, a place that we're going, something that we're experiencing. And I think learning about documentary photography and trying to take a documentary approach can be a fantastic way to build skills. That trip I referenced to Japan, I didn't take any post photos. You know, it was sort of all trying to document what I was seeing. So you can practice without even 
going off and like getting permission from somebody to um, to um, tell their story in a bigger way. The other thing I would say is photograph what you love. Photograph what you're what moves you, um, whether it's vi you know visually moves you because you think it's beautiful or it emotionally moves you because you care about the story. Um, I mean, you're gonna do your best work when you're invested in that way. I, I would say, I, I was a freelancer for 13 years before I got hired at in The New Globe. In New York, right? In New York, in Dallas, in Boston. Um, and I think that you know freelancing is really tough, but uh, I would say don't lose hope and that there is actually a lot of in some ways, there's a lot of freedom in freelancing because you can pitch your stories and go out and tell the stuff that you want us to tell. And I think if you're just starting out, um, it's really important to look at a ton of work and see what connects with you. And you know, um, I think in the beginning when people start out, like for me, I was trying to emulate other photographers whose work I really loved. And eventually I found my own style. And I think it just takes being there and doing it and failing a lot um, to eventually get to a point where you can make a career of it. But it certainly comes with a lot of failure. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's an interesting question about privacy here and how we've talked a lot about vulnerability and sacred spaces. How do you, uh, in a world where you know so much is happening without consent, how do you navigate really um, persuading someone you're taking pictures of that you know you respect and honor their privacy um, i know that there are rules around taking someone's picture outside of their home maybe you hide the address or you know we hide the license plate number how do you navigate privacy that is a huge question there are so many different situations i mean because we do photography like you know we were all recently at some of the protests here after the roe v wade leak and you know, they're, you're often photographing people and you can't get to them. You know, you, right. you can't get over to them and have that conversation. You can't reach them. There's no time to do it. So, you know, for me, it's, I, I just always ask myself, am I being respectful, you know, and the way I'm going about making this image is, you know, if somebody saw this image, you know, would, would they feel misrepresented in some way? So I think it's just a lens that I constantly have to work on. When I am closer to somebody and in, in touch with them, I think it gets back to the, you know, really like seeing where the person is as you're photographing them, really like checking in directly, not just sensing, but checking in directly and respecting if something feels bad. Yeah. Um, it's really that. And I don't, I don't ever want to be convincing someone, yeah. right? I, I think that's a bad place to be. I, I would much rather find somebody that's open. Uh, it's not always, like you say, it's not always possible in our day-to-day -day stuff, but certainly on, on any sort of longer term story, the people have to know where you're coming from and uh, otherwise you just, it's never gonna really work. Yeah. Um, question, <clears throat> final question from the audience that we'll share, favorite photo assignment ever? Oh, Jess, I need to think about this for a minute because there are too many. So really? I feel like you guys walk around, you two walk around with cameras all the time. Uh, I feel like you oh have this answer. I know, but it's so <laughs> hard to choose. I guess it changes right? from day to day. Well, it's also so hard to choose because um, these, these photographs, they're like your children, right? I mean, it's like, how can you compare amazing, incredible events that you've been able to witness? And yeah. Well, how about most unforgettable photo assignment? <sighs> All right. I'm, I would, if you ask me this question in six months, it might be a different answer, but I'm going to hone in on two, which is actually this experience with Anne Laurie was, was really fantastic and um, powerful for me, and I really enjoyed it. And then um, twice in the last 10 years, and I've- Anne Laurie is the woman who experienced yes. tremendous loss. Yes, and, sorry. You know, graduated from high school. Our high school and, senior yeah. that you saw a little bit ago. Um, and then uh, twice this last decade, I've had the privilege of covering the Paralympic Games, first in London and then in Sochi for some other projects from GBH. And that was life changing for me. Um, and, you know, both in terms of, of being able to photograph on that stage, but just really the the level of athleticism and sport was just so profound to me. And um, when you get a sports photo right, they're really beautiful. <laughs> they're really beautiful to document. So, all right, I will. I guess I will choose. Now a, you have some time to think yeah, about. Yeah. Okay. I'll choose Thanks a, for sure that. Choose a favorite is. child. Um, I did a story years back about a little boy named Leo who was very badly burned in a fire in Burundi. And um, this boy, this, this man, Alex, who was 25, who was not related to him, took him in 
took him to Boston because he spoke English and um, got him treatment here in Shriners. And so I got to follow them through. And all these years later, we're still in touch. And Alex has basically adopted Leo. They are two of the most amazing and just incredible people I've ever met. Um, and so I think for me, that was a story that just has always stayed with me. And it was such a privilege to be able to tell that story. So there was a winner for the Boston Press Photographers uh, Association, um, you know, contest. And I want us to, uh, you know, um, look at the picture that won first place in the feature category and talk about that. So if we want to show that, this is the photo. Oh, yes. yeah. It looks like we're looking <laughs> at um, someone either catching or throwing a lobster. I don't know which one it is. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> probably throwing, not catching, because who would be tossing? Right. Um, yeah. Tell us about this. What are we seeing? So this is, and from, this is from you. This is from me. Uh, this is Virginia Oliver. She's 101 years young. Uh, she is out on her lobster boat with her son, Max, who's, I think, like 78. Um, and. You know, she started lobstering when she was eight years old before the start of the Great Depression. And she took some time off to have kids and then she got right back to it. So she has been working hard for so long. And, um, and this type of work is not easy work, right? Like it's repetitive. I don't think I could do it. It's, you know, it's really, really getting in there with your hands. I think it's got carpal tunnel written all over it, right? When you're picking up lobsters and banding them. Um, so she's tossing back a, a short lobster. Um, which is something that happens like a million times, <laughs> right? When, when you go out on a lobster boat, they throw back so much of their catch. Um, but she was just such an incre incredible person and to see her out there still doing this work was so amazing. And when we posted this story online, um, this photo just like took on a life of its own <laughs> and it went viral, which I never really expected and people memed it and um, Somebody joked that like she was summoning the lobster from the sea like a Jedi, and then Mark Hamill tweeted it, and, oh, get out. and I was like, "Oh my God, Luke Skywalker just commented on my photo! Like, what is happening?" So that was really, it was really incredible, and also just kind of incredible to think about this like 101 year old woman going viral. And for you to get that shot, you had to be on the boat. You were on the boat. I was on the boat. Yeah, you were on the boat. What was that like? For some reason, looking at that, I could. <laughs> get a sense of the smells, you know, of all, like, what was that experience? Like? There are a lot of smells on a lobster boat, for yeah. sure. Um, it's funny, because I spent, like, a whole summer doing a lobster story, and, uh, and I'm, I get seasick, so I was taking a lot of Dramamine and kind of out of it, but no, this, uh, <laughs> this, this was really great, because I was just kind of crouched down in front of where she was banding and, and just photographing her as she was tossing stuff out, and... You know, the timing of this photo, I think um, I, I started my career shooting sports, and I think you can see it in the timing, right? It's, it's there. It's like that sports yeah, moment. You get that shot. Wow. Um, yeah, but no, this was, it was just like such a treat. I mean, really, there are days where you feel like you're not at work, and this was definitely one of those days. You just feel like you're having an adventure. Well, did they give you one to eat? I, you know what, they offered. Maybe and, you can't answer um, that. No, no, they, they did. They offered me, and I said, I've, I, after seeing how much work goes into this, I will never take a lobster for free. Like, uh, you, you guys should definitely get paid for every one that you pull out of the sea. Well, that's great. Um, so, you know, what is one thing that both of you hope will be taken from this exhibit? Um, you know, and why should people be compelled to go and see this exhibit and remember? Because some of these memories are hard and, and unpleasant and inelegant. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope that, you know, by seeing some of these images that people maybe gain a greater appreciation for the work that we're doing. Of course, just the, the deeply important role of photojournalism in journalism in general, but in everything that's happening in this world to have that visual record of things. Um, I also, there are so many talented photojournalists here who are so dedicated and I feel like that comes through in the work and I, um, it's thrilling for me to be able to, for us to give it back to the public to enjoy and to take in and perhaps learn something from. And I hope that people will see that um, beyond just artistry, what they might associate with, with photography, I, I would like them to see that there's a lot of thought that goes into these pictures that in a lot of ways, um, 
photojournalists are out there being as thoughtful as the reporters that are accompanying them on their stories. And so, yeah, I, I would just like them to come away with a better understanding of photojournalism and this moment that we've just lived through because we've all collectively gone through it. And I think what this exhibit does really well um, is it takes us through the highs and lows, and yes, some of it is difficult, but I think there's also a tremendous amount of resilience there and, um, and moments of joy, and, and I think those are equally as important because we're all getting through it. Well, for people here in the audience and people um, watching online, you can view this exhibit in Copley Square Copley Square until May 25th, right? Mm -hmm. um, when it will travel to Jamaica Pond uh, in Jamaica Plain, where it will be until June 10th. So we got a bit of a window here for people to take this in. Um, and for those here uh, at the Boston Public Library, Meredith and Jess uh, and some other photographers would like you to take a walk with them after we're done here. And they'll take you to the exhibit where you can see it uh, in real time and process it for yourself. Jessica Rinaldi, Boston Globe photographer, Meredith Nierman, GBH News Director of Photography. I'm Lee Hill, Lee Hill, uh, <laughs> Executive Editor for GBH News, um, when I can say my own name at least. Thank you both for being here. Thank you all for taking this in. And those watching, we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you.